Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Jennifer Tobin and I am the Deputy Administrator of the Natural Hazard Center here at the University of Colorado Boulder. I am so excited to welcome you all to this informational question and answer session for our third special call for proposals for our Public Health Disaster Research Award Program. And before we jump in, I just want to take a moment to thank the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the National Science Foundation for generously continuing to fund this program and allowing us to support so many amazing scholars, many of whom I know are on this call today. I would also like to take a moment to thank Center Director Lori Peek, as well as Research Associates Rachel Adams and Megan Morty for helping to build and administer this Public Health Research Award program to make all of this possible. We are so very proud of this program and the many ways it has already contributed to improving public health knowledge and practice in so many underserved communities, and we look forward to seeing what the next round of proposals will bring. And so before we begin, I also would like to take a moment to acknowledge the ongoing devastation caused by Hurricane Fiona in Puerto Rico. Our hearts go out to all of our friends and colleagues on the islands. And um, we understand that many of you may be wanting to submit a proposal related to this event, but could not be on this call today. So if you're watching this later on, I do wanna um, ask you to please reach out to us directly if you have any questions. Did somebody say something? Oh, okay. Okay, so yes, if you're in Puerto Rico and you can't be live here on the call today to ask your questions, please do reach out to us and let us know if you have any questions or comments related to this call. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so our main objectives today are to provide a brief overview of the Public Health Disaster Research Award Program. Uh, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with it, we're going to review the special call for proposals. We are going to offer advice and best practices for how you can construct a successful research proposal. We are going to hear from some of our past awardee recipients who have kindly offered to share their experiences and lessons learned as they went through the program themselves. And finally, and most importantly, we want to hear from all of you and answer any questions you might have in preparation for applying for this award funding. And just so you know, this meeting is being recorded, like I said, so we can post it back to our special call page for anyone who could not attend in person. And so we encourage you also to share this um, video with other people who couldn't be here today. And I invite everyone to please put your questions in the chat box as we move along through our, our brief presentation so that we can make sure and answer them in the Q&A um, section at the end. Next slide, please. Okay, so the Public Health Disaster Research Award Program was first established in 2020. And as I said, it was generously funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the National Science Foundation. This is one of four research award programs at the Natural Hazards Center. And so for this award program, to date, we have released three special calls, including this one. Our first call was broadly open to people interested in um, uh, studying, doing research in the U.S. territories. Um, and then our second call was also focused on research in U.S. territories, but this time was more specifically geared to uh, strengthening community resilience. And during the first two calls, we ended up funding 26 unique projects. And you can read those final reports on our website, which the link to that page is now in the chat. And our third special call that Rachel and Megan will be talking more about in depth very soon has expanded the regional focus to include research in tribal areas and rural communities in addition to research in US territories. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel Adams who will discuss this call in more detail. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Yes, um, so to provide a little overview of this uh, new call. So for this special call, we're interested in public health preparedness, response, and uh, resilience to disasters in the inhabited US territories, tribal areas, and rural communities across the United States. And so these areas um, are historically, geographically, socially, and culturally unique. And as we've seen from past disasters, they are also at higher risk to adverse disaster impacts, including death and property loss, uh, the many other regions in the United States. And so research is really urgently needed um, to develop evidence-based practices to improve community preparedness, resilience, and public health response to disasters in these regions. And this special call is designed to address these gaps in knowledge. So the special call uh, will fund uh, in between 10 and 15 awards in the amount of $15,000 to $50,000 each. 
Um, and some pre-submission requirements are that uh, you'll have to schedule, a, a, the lead investigator of each team will have to schedule at least one 15 uh, minute meeting with myself um, so that we can kind of discuss the proposal and I can provide feedback to help you strengthen your proposal. Um, as well as the lead investigator must complete our Converge Public Health Implications of Hazards and Disaster Research Training Module. So some key dates. Um, well, the deadline to submit your proposal and the pre-submission requirements, um, including uh, your certificate of completion for the, the, um, the Converge Training Module is due at 5 p.m. Mountain Time on Friday, October 7th, 2022. And so for those of you uh, who are funded, there is a 20 page double spaced uh, report that's summarizing the project activities and results that will be due on March 31st, uh, 2023. So this means you only have five months total really to complete your project from November 1st when we'll first announce whose uh, the awards are. Uh, and so uh, until the first uh, report, uh, first draft of the report is due. Uh, in addition to uh, meeting the March 31st uh, uh, requirement for the report, we will also have um, uh, an internal meeting. So each uh, report will be uh, extensively reviewed both by an internal reviewer as well as an external reviewer. And then you will receive that written feedback. And then on uh, May 2nd, excuse me, um, on, yes, on May 2nd, 2023, uh, we will host a webinar where you'll get to actually discuss that feedback with the reviewers as well as representatives from the CDC and the Natural Hazard Center. And then finally, as the last kind of deliverable of this project, we'll be hosting a public webinar on August 3rd, 2023, where each of the awarded groups will have the opportunity to present on their research findings. So some important uh, considerations for this funding call. So uh, your proposal really should have a clear and feasible timeline uh, that includes plans for your data collection, analysis, publication, and report writing. You know, as I mentioned previously, there are these key dates, and that should really be incorporated in the, in the timeline that you submit with your proposal. <clears throat> Given the short time frame, uh, researchers may need to actually begin collecting data prior to the funding being released, and we can't uh, really grant any uh, deliverable deadline extensions, um, even if it takes some time for funding to be released due to, you know, maybe not having the IRB ready or, or whatnot. Um, so, uh, you know, data collection also cannot occur prior to IRB receipts. Um, and we do we have developed a uh, some guidance for receiving IRB uh, approval for disaster research in advance of actually going into the field. Um, so if Megan, you want to share that link, that would be great. <clears throat> some other uh, requirements for award funding: uh, the lead investigator uh, must be um, a an academic uh, must belong to an academic institution from a U.S. state, territory, or tribal area. And uh, the award funding can be distributed to up to five uh, members of the research team, um, including you know, the, the main investigator, co-leads, project assistants, uh, as well as other local collaborators. And then once all IRB approval and award agreement documents are submitted, payments will be sent directly to the award recipient, so not to their university. It has to go to individuals as we don't allow overhead for this funding call. So now I'm going to hand it over to Megan, who's going to provide some advice on uh, some tips for strong proposals. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you to everyone who's here today. It's exciting to see so many people participating in this call and interested in participating in this project. Um, first off, I'm just going to give a few tips about, you know, as you're developing your proposal, things that we're really looking for in the proposals that we want to see. That first thing is something Rachel mentioned when she went over those key areas. Um, we want to see that 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 you are producing like an actual research that can inform the evidence base. You know what does that mean? We want to see results that you are, that have public implications that you can share with agencies and organizations in the area where they can improve, um, you know, help improve disaster preparedness and response in in the regions that we're interested in. Again, just to reemphasize what Rachel said about having that re feasible research design, we want you to think as you go into the field. You know, as you're preparing your proposal that you have five months to complete data collection, do that preliminary analysis and write that report. So that means, you know, starting around November 1st, when we're going to do the award announcement, 
um, in between March 31st, when you have to write that first report, you really need to think about the, those methods that you're gonna use, those research questions that you're structuring. Can I answer those um, research questions in this five month time period? And um, are these methods things that I'm gonna be able to do in five months? So um, as you're developing your proposal, really kind of think about uh, making sure that those things fit within the timeline. Um, as I said, you know, think about your research questions, craft research questions that are, are gonna produce those actionable public implications that we're interested in seeing. Um, we also are like, interested in proposals that are utilizing a social determinants of health or health equity lens. And we have guidance on the website. We'll share a link um, in the chat about you know, if you're not familiar with the, that type of those lenses, please, you know, refer to that guidance on the website. Um, we're also interested in projects that um, are, in, are working to engage public health departments and organizations in the region where you're working. Um, and we want, you know, projects that have the, you know, research teams that are thinking about building a strong working relationship with the people in the region. Um, or they already have a familiar, familiarity with the geographic or cultural context that they wish to study. Okay, and now we have this, you know, a special opportunity to hear from two people who have done these research projects in the past. We are very honored to have them. And we're gonna have Eileen Segarra, who's gonna start off. And then we have Diana Ramirez-Rios. So Eileen, if you wanna go ahead. Oh, good afternoon to all of us. Thank you for the invitation. And Jennifer, thank you for your solidarity with Puerto Rico. Um, so I think the main lesson that we learned while we were working on this project is that time goes fast. So keeping in mind that you have to have a preliminary report five months from the start of the, of the project, but that really um, put some pressure in terms of the work that you have to do. So in our case, we have two components. We have some a quantitative analysis with administrative data from the Department of Education. And we have also a qualitative research using interviews with school staff. So we were able to complete actually the data analysis, the, the administrative data analysis before the preliminary date, deadline. So that helped us a lot because at least we have a completed work that we could present and have final results, results with regard to the to the data analysis. So, um, so one of the limitations we have um, were the and, and in terms of the of the administrative data before we send the proposal, we were already working with the Department of Education to have the data agreement, the data transfer agreement. So that also helped us a lot. On the other hand. We have delayed with the IRB process and also the scope, I think the scope of our project was a little bit too big because besides the administrative data analysis, we also have interviews. We have about a, a 12 individual interviews plus a group interviews. So unfortunately we were not able to include most of the findings from the qualitative part of the analysis in the preliminary report, even though we have all the quantitative analysis done. So in terms of the recommendation that, that I will give, one is to plan ahead, especially if you're gonna uh, gather qualitative data because that usually takes longer. So as, as you mentioned, it is important to have the IRB. I think I will recommend everybody to do the IRB before or while they're writing the proposal so they can be sure that by the time, if they, if they get the funding, by the time they get the funding, the, IR, the IRB is already approved. Um, also, um, define the scope of the, pro, of the project in accordance with the time framework and also in accordance with the resources you're gonna have. And finally, I think if your scope definitely will need more than four to six months, well, I would recommend is to try to subdivide your project into subcomponents and make sure that you can finalize some of those subcomponents before the preliminary report deadline. So that way you have something that you can actually present that will be uh, fairly completed, even though 
one part is not completely independent of the other, but if you at least have some subcomponents that can stand alone in terms of results, then you'll be able to present a preliminary report, even if you're still doing some ongoing research uh, that you wanna do in addition to what you're gonna be presenting in that preliminary report. Okay, thank you, Eileen. Um, I don't see Diana on the call right now. Diana, are you there? Okay. Um, okay, let's give a round of applause to Eileen. I don't think Diana's here, so we're going to move now into the question and answer phase. I think, Jennifer, you're going to take this part, right? Yes, definitely. Thank you. And then if uh, Diana is able to connect at some point, we can jump back in and listen to her presentation as well. Um, but yeah, so right now, the idea is that we just open it up and we're here to answer any questions, comments, concerns. Um, I know it's a lot what we have written on our website. There's a lot of details for each of these um, special calls. So we just want to make sure to provide maximum clarity and to answer any questions you might have. So feel free to drop your comments in the chat or just raise your hand with a little hand raising button or just jump on and ask the question and I'll help facilitate those. Uh, Lan. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you um, for this. Um, I'm working on a project um, on a public health toolkit to do research in um, diverse communities. And um, we had a question about the funding agreement. So like the lead investigator has to come from an academic institution, but then the payments can't go to the institution can we get clarification on that yeah i'll go ahead and take that one actually since i, I will help with the funding part of it a lot um so yes these are research awards they act more like scholarships or fellowships and they cannot be routed through your university because we've not allowed for any overhead or indirect costs or anything so they have to go directly to the researchers um but given that this money does come from the national science foundation and the centers for disease control and prevention we we do have to make sure that the lead investigator is representing an institution an academic institution in the united states um but the money can can be distributed across up to five people. So even though that lead investigator has to be from an academic institution um, from the United States, the other investigators or collaborators that want to receive part of the money can come from internationally. They can be local collaborators, but the money will go directly to them as well as that lead investigator. And in our award agreement, you would just write in who will be receiving what amount of money, depending on how much you were awarded. And so, thank you. Uh, so does that go into their like personal account or does it get routed? Yes, it's part of the agreement of, of submitting a proposal and accepting the award money. The award money goes directly to that person and any kind of tax ramifications that are a result from accepting that money are the personal responsibility of who accepts the money. Okay, thank you. And Jen, I do see that Diana uh, had a chance to join us. Um, okay. Maybe we should pause um, and we can hear from her. Okay, great. I saw Melanie had a question and I will jump back to Melanie as soon as we hear from Diana. Hi. I'm Hi, sorry. Diana. I how are you? I, I had a miss, I had a miss schedule. I don't know. It it told me it was in in an hour so yeah sorry about that <laughs> no worries no worries it's perfect timing so i'm glad you jumped on and feel free to just start talking to um all of our guests here today about your experiences going through the public health research award program okay thank you for for allowing me to kind of speak here and i i really i wanted to kind of give give the uh, uh, my main lessons because really it would it helped me a lot a lot a uh, then looking in retrospective of what would have been gone better in the application. Uh, when I applied, I was kind of new in, in all the um, all this process of proposals through Natural Hazard Center. And uh, one thing that I wanna highlight is all the instructions were really clear. So that was very important for like to follow up. But one thing I struggled with and I didn't know uh, was uh, first the IRB, the IRB commitments before the, the 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 application, um, I I I kind of had that uh that did did not do it on time, so that really limited me on on when I could eventually start to do my my interviews. So one thing I would highlight is to start to do your IRB applications from from the beginning. A uh, uh, even though it's something I didn't know, it's like you can do it even though you don't know if you're uh, if you're 
project is is approved. So uh, you you can start to request those authorizations, uh, like a preliminary authorization for your for your project. So that was one big highlight uh, from the from the process. Um, and uh, another thing is if if you have connections uh, that of course that those are the ones that are going to be. Uh, Part of your your proposal, uh, make sure you you add uh, include those uh, early on in your in your proposal process. Some of them you might not have a, a like a confirmation, uh, which happened to us. We we had a, a number of connections and then uh, we didn't. Those, some of them were really busy. They they wouldn't answer us on time for like the application. So it's important to get those contacts uh, uh, on early, early in the process. So um, yeah, that was kind of the the two big things for us in the in the in, in the pro in the process of the application. Uh, for us, it was a really really important to to kind of get um, get your get the proposal. It's a short proposal for like what we want to uh, write and. Uh, um, we want to write it to as straightforward as possible. Um, I, I struggle with that because English is not my first language, but <laughs> that kind of um, in, impulsed me to, you know, knowing the limitations, kind of write straight, straight to the point. Uh, so yeah, I think that's kind of what I, I wanted to, to share the main highlights. Thank you so much, Diana. And of course, if anybody has any questions for Diana or Eileen, feel free to ask those as well. Um, but now I'll go and return to Melanie Gull, I believe had a question, her hand up prior to going to Diana. So Melanie, do you wanna yes. jump on? Yes, thank you, Jennifer. And it kind of piggies back on the question that Lon asked. And I'm glad I actually got a response from my sponsored awards person. And I wonder, you know, how others actually managed to do this because my sponsored awards de facto told me I cannot do this on ASU time. No, I'm with Arizona State, so I cannot do it on my university time. I cannot use university resources. I cannot hire students. I cannot use the IRB. So de facto telling me I cannot submit. Wow. So I, I know every university is very different in how they offer advice in this capacity. So I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. exactly how other, I mean, maybe Diana or Eileen can talk about how their universities or even more and I see on here has handled this in a variety of ways too. So if anybody wants to jump on and offer your advice, um, Lauren, do you want to say something? I see your little hand up there. Yeah, so I've gotten uh, awards and other calls in the past um, and I've used my IRB uh, because it's not going to the institution. I haven't had to route it. Um, no one's ever thrown up any roadblocks. I would encourage if you have a, a maybe a stricter institution um, to just submit your IRB. Like I do research all the time. That's not funded, right? Like I want to do collect some pilot data if I use my, you know, startup funds or whatever. So, I mean, there's I I've never been in an institution that had a rule that said you had to have funding to use the IRB. Um, and so I think it could be very institution specific and likely you could work around it with the IRB part of it um, and just say I have unfunded, you know, not institutionally funded research. I've been at, I've done it at three different institutions and it's worked fine. Were you able to work with students? Um, yeah, so if you if you just pay the students directly, so I've listed students like one of my five people, they mm -hmm. get a check in the mail, they do some stuff and we just like it's not um, through like a formal assistantship like they're not getting like the, the funding amounts aren't enough to like cover, you know, a, a grad research assistant. So really it's like hourly I usually end up doing it like, you know, it's this much money for doing this work. Um, and students are happy to have the compensation and to contribute and I've done that. It's really nice, actually, because I've done it with students at other institutions. Like I had a, a a small proposal in the weather ready research, and we had four people at four different institutions and a student at a fifth institution. And so the money just got to go to all the places. It was much less bureaucratically like difficult for that collaboration to happen because the checks get cut right to the people. Mm -hmm. um, I think not framing it to your institution as a grant um, might be a good strategy but just say I you know I'm doing some unfunded work and then work things out with people um 
offline. Yeah, and that is why we specifically call it a research award program and not a grant program anymore, because institutionally for us, even we had to change that language because this is not a grant, this is a research award for, to individuals. Okay, I know we have some questions in the chat here, so let me just jump on those. Um, can you share how much it would be appropriate for the members of the team to get paid? Diego asked that question. Rachel or Megan, would you like to answer that? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think that when you provide a, a budget justification, um, it has to be commensurate with what you would normally be paid per hour at your current, you know, rates at your university. And so, um, similarly, if you're hiring students and you're providing them with a stipend, it also should be commensurate with what they would be paid on an hourly basis and your anticipated, uh, you know, time commitment from the various investigators on the team. Uh, so we don't really have a specific guideline there. You just, you know, you have the opportunity in your budget justification to justify the number that you attribute uh, to, to paying each member of the research team. Does that answer your question, Diego? His mic wasn't working, so. Oh, okay, that's right, okay. Um, okay. The next question is from Shang De Gao. Um, he says, uh, hi, everyone. May I ask what types of delivery are expected by this special call? For example, online platform, empirical findings, or actionable recommendations and suggestions. If the NHC expects online tools or platforms, or the findings suggestions are more important. Um, so Megan, do you want to take that one? Sure, great question. So I think we're really looking for those empirical findings that you can then translate into those public implications, those actionable, actionable recommendations that you had in the latter part of your question. That, let me know if that makes sense. Do you have any other, do you wanna ask anything else? Okay. I just wanted to jump on uh, to that. So our main, you know, requirements in terms of deliverables, you know, we mentioned those key dates are really the, the reports. And within that report, you will have the opportunity to describe your findings, uh, as well as describe the public health implications of your work. Um, that being said, you know, proposals that involve very actionable oriented research where you do have the ability to disseminate your findings to a wider audience, perhaps to be a website or some webinar or, you know, some other means um, are definitely going to be stronger. Okay, Jean, would you like to jump on and, and ask your question or your, your statement about invitation to collaborate? Jean, would you like to, oh, there you go. I can see you've unmuted. Maybe not hearing, I'll read it though. Um, so Jean Sean says, Associate Professor of Engineering Management at the University of Houston, Clear Lake. Um, his research team led by Dr. Jung is working on incorporating social vulnerability into facility location models. We are welcoming collaborations with researchers focused on social vulnerability. And he lists his email there if anybody would like to collaborate. Thank you, Jean, for that. Um, and then Deborah, Let's see, how long does it take to get um, to do the IRB application? Um, I think that is very university specific and your IRB specific. So <laughs> it really is dependent on how fast your um, particular IRB works. Do you have another question around that, Deborah? No, okay, <laughs> thank you. All right, Joanne, do you wanna jump on and ask your question? Not necessarily, just, Go, go ahead to the answer. Okay, um, so Joanne asks, what are the equity guidelines that you will be using when assessing the proposals? What are the ways in which you are being accountable to the communities that you, that choose to participate? That is an amazing question. Um, Megan or Rachel, do you wanna take that? Sure, I'm gonna drop in the chat real quick, the public health guidance that we have on the website. Um, and Rachel, go ahead and jump in too if you wanna add to this. But um, Okay, let me go back to the question. Um, so the public health guidance is on the on the website. And then as you said, um, the ways that we are looking for you to be accountable to the communities that you choose to, to work with are, you know, how are you, um, we, we, we're expecting you to come up with a plan 
at the end about how you're gonna share this with the community. So we wanna see as part of your proposal, who are you working with? What are the organizations that you're working with? What kind of ideas are you planning? You know, re results from your project are you planning to share with them? So that's kind of like the accountability that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Do you wanna add, that's a wonderful question, Joanne. Do you wanna add any more? Sure, uh, I wanted to add a little bit too. Um, so when we go through and review proposals, we have a number of criteria that relate about, back to, to your question. Um, for instance, you know, we, we do prioritize teams where there are um, students and early career researchers, um, you know, people from underrepresented uh, groups. Um, we also uh, have a section of the proposal where we ask you to write uh, an ethics statement where you consider, you know, the, the populations you're working with and, um, you know, the important ethical considerations that you should have. So there are a number of things built into the proposal itself that really allow us as a reviewer to go in and ensure that, you know, we, we are going to be prioritizing uh, groups Groups that are take that equitable approach to their research. Thank you, Rachel and Megan. Okay, next question. Sherry, do you want to jump on and ask your question? Okay, I'm not seeing her on mute, so I'll go ahead and ask it. Since the funds are sent directly to the award recipient, there is nothing required of the lead investigator's sponsored programs office or an AO. AOR approval when submitting the proposal. No, we do not interact with your sponsored award programs at all. We don't interact with the universities at all. This is a direct relationship between the Natural Hazards Center and the individuals receiving the award money. Um, and in fact, we're not allowed to offer any like tax advice or anything related to that. Um, the money goes directly to the individuals and that's the end of that. We do not also track your um, expenses or anything. So there's no need to submit any kind of receipts or paperwork about how you spent the money. We just uh, review your budget proposal and um, estimate that that is a, a, an effective way to spend the money based on what your proposal includes. And then it is up to the people who receive the money to then um, use that money, how it was outlined in the budget. Okay. We have another question um, from Jenny. Do I need IRB approval from the Natural Hazard Center IRB in addition to my academic institution's IRB? No, the Natural Hazard Center does not oversee any IRB um, approvals. You would have to get that from your own institution and then submit us the letter of exemption or approval from your university. And so um, if your any kind of research that you're doing includes human subjects, we do require that you submit um, the paperwork, either exemption or approval from your IRB. And Chelsea, hi, Chelsea. <laughs> um, do you want to jump on and ask your question? Just so I don't have to be speaking the whole time. Okay, I'm not seeing Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea asked, just a thought in response to that, the IRBs handed, handle unfunded research. So I would assume this would um, be treated as an unfunded project. Um, so again, every institution is different. Your IRBs have different ways of handling things. So that is between your relationship with your university and how you submit that. Okay, let's see. She also asks if the rules allow for people to pay themselves during the summer if they are on an academic on a nine month contract. So it, we really are paying you outside of any kind of university contract. So how you, you know, allocate that for your funding is, um, is totally up to you. Okay, here's a good question from Amber. Can you define hazard or the scope of what you would consider as an unnatural hazard? I work with HABs and it is not listed under FEMA's definition, but do you consider it within the scope? Rachel, I think this is a good question for you. Yes, um, we actually discussed this yesterday during a meeting. Um, so I think what we think of hazard, um, you know, we think of these various naturally derived hazards that can lead to disasters. There's obviously, you know, human initiated um, disaster events as well. Um, but when it comes to framing this proposal, uh, we don't want to just take a more general environmental hazard approach, as there are a lot of, you know, contaminants in the environment that uh, don't really fall or constitute under what we think of as a hazard that could lead to a disaster. However, uh, we do think that something like algal blooms could potentially be disastrous if that's something that impacts, you know, the drinking water to a certain extent that, you know, you have to, the local government has to have national boil uh, water advisory. 
boundaries, et cetera. Um, if you think about something like a Flint, Michigan uh, crisis where the water quality was so poor that that was truly a disaster, um, that is definitely appropriate. So thinking about that environmental hazard and, and the work that you may do might be more preventative in trying to prevent the, the onset of an actual disaster, like a large scale disaster. But if you frame it as such that that is your ultimate goal is to prevent a disaster, to promote population health, it should suffice. Um, you just have to be very clear in trying to uh, explain that within your proposal, uh, given that we do come from a more traditional, you know, natural hazard and, and disaster background. Great. And Amber, do you have anything else you want to add to that question? Or did that clarify things for you? Uh, and that was really helpful. Thank you. I appreciate it. And <laughs> Great. Thank you. Do co-investigators need to have specific credentials? All right, Thomas asked that question. Megan, do you want to take that one? Sure. Thanks, Jen. Um, no, you can work with members of the community that if you would like to have them as a co-investigator, um, students can can be, you know, receive the payments. So no, they don't have to have specific credentials as far as, um, you know, being associated with an academic institution. Okay, great. Does that answer your question, Thomas? Yes. Okay, thank you. And Joanne has a follow-up comment, which says researchers should strive to embody cultural humility when working with historically excluded communities. Thank you for that. We absolutely agree. Um, Thomas has another question. Is there similar limitations in the incentives you provide for the community participants? We found better results providing higher incentives with agricultural workers in the past. Thomas, can you elaborate on what kind of incentives you're talking about? So in, uh, in a previous conversation uh, for the budget line items having to be justified, they mentioned um, having something that was similar to the pay scale um, that they, they were receiving at their university. Um, but what my concern is, is that uh, a lot of these surveys give uh, an incentive of like $20. And that's not uh, commensurate with the time that, especially people that, that have other things to do, uh, taking care of their families will have. And so we found more success giving like at least $100 um, uh, incentives for follow-up interviews um, uh, with agricultural workers. And so, um, I but I don't think any intellectual academic kind of it's not the frame that they think of. They don't see value in the same way um, that the communities that we we work with, especially if they're being impacted by a natural disaster. And so um, that was my question is that, do you have similar limitations and what you see as justified for the incentives that you provide to your participants um, versus the, the limitations that you described um, in terms of how you would pay somebody that's doing the investigation. Thank you, Thomas, for that great question. And yes, we just so you know, we are very flexible in this and it really is about your justification. So if your particular population, such as agricultural workers, if you think that is what is it would be required or would be the best ethical incentive for them, please just state that in your proposal. We don't actually have any limitations. So, you know, we're not going to, you know, go back and double check what someone gets paid versus hourly. That's just a, a typical academic way to, you know, rate how much you're asking for in, in your, you know, the time commitment to this project. But of course, we understand that it's different across contexts, it's different across places. And so, um, yeah, so please just provide a justification for why you're saying you're requesting a certain amount of money. And that's definitely acceptable. And I just wanted to add to that um, and, and say that, you know, if you have experience working with specific populations, I mean, that is one, something we definitely value in these proposals, but two is that is your, you know, personal insider information that you can then use to justify. So because you have prior experience, you know what it actually is an appropriate incentive. Um, that is a very strong justification. Thank you for that question, Thomas. Okay, let's see. Oh, and Thomas put the, the link to the farm worker study in there. Thank you for adding that. Um, okay. 
I have a question from Jenny. Do you want me to read that? Yes, please. Okay. Right, Jenny, 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 do you want to jump in and ask your question? I don't see you coming up. <laughs> there you are. Hi, totally. Thank you. So I was just asking, I'm a PhD student and um, I'm working on my RB now and um, I'm doing a mixed methods design and I was wanting to see if there could be funding for, since there's such a short timeline, if there could be funding for that first phase, um, because with a mixed methods design, you would still um, look at that first phase, you know, and I could provide a report on that first phase, but it would be too there's not enough time to do all of it. So my question would be, would that be if it's possible to do it and have it for just that first phase? I'll go ahead and answer, Jenny. I think that's a wonderful idea to face it in that way. Um, I think that's very smart, um, given especially the limitations of the timeline. Um, I also saw there that you had that, can a student be a PI or does the faculty mentor be a PI? The student can be a PI. So if you are a dissertation <laughs> student, you can do that. Um, and I think when you write your report, you can, you know, have my future work, you'll have a section where you're going to say what your future research is going to be, and you can talk about your second phase of your project. So yeah, I think that's a wonderful way to frame it. Awesome. Thank you. I would also <laughs> ask that, um, Megan, too, just um, when you're writing your proposal, just be very careful about including what you're going to do for this research for this report and try not <laughs> to go too much into all the dissertation research because it might um, make it look, you know, unfeasible. So just definitely right. keep it, keep it very clear with this you know, phase of your research will be. And then also, even though you can be a PI as a graduate student, uh, we just do require another a letter of support usually or a paragraph of support from your advisor saying that absolutely you can complete this research in the time frame um, while also doing your graduate studies. And I, I wonder too, Jen and Megan, that was excellent. And Eileen and her remarks started to talk about how she had to end up doing the phased approach. So Eileen, I don't know if you might say a little more about how you and your team figured out like we're going to report on the quantitative but we have this other data so maybe if you could expand a little bit to help Jenny with thinking through what she might put in her proposal thank you oh you're on mute Eileen I think you're on mute still thank you yeah I think what what Jenny was mentioned seems very similar to what we did because we have a quantitative analysis part and then we have a qualitative analysis part. And in our case, as I mentioned before, and I think we all been actually emphasizing the same thing, we did the IRB after we already had the funding. So that kind of delayed all the, the data gathering from the interviews. So by the time we were, we needed to 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 have the preliminary. First of all, I think when we were working on the proposal, we were not so clear about the timeline, and and we were expecting to have a final product by October, with both the quantitative phase and the qualitative phase. So when we realized that we needed to have a preliminary result report by April, in, in our case was but in in April. Um, then we already have the data from the Department of Education. So that is one analysis that we knew we could complete. So that's when we decide, okay, we're gonna do the preliminary report with the data, the, quality, the quantitative data analysis, because we knew we could, we could finish that on time. Um, we continue to do the interviews. We actually finish all the interviews by, by May, but, Unfortunately, we were not able to include a lot of those results in the in the in the preliminary report, but we continue working on it and we've been publishing them. So I think the main thing is to try to think of what can you do that will be a final product. That's what I, what I meant when I recommend that if you if the scope of your project is longer than four or six months, then you should think about okay, how can I divide this project into subcomponents that even though they are interrelated among them, each of them can stand by itself in terms of results. Mm -hmm. So you can have a, a, a report that actually has some con conclusion that have some recommendation based on that phase. So I think it, it, it's, it's a matter of thinking, what can you accomplish in that five month period 
that will allow you to actually get to some conclusions and then serve as a starting point for the rest of your research. Thank you, Eileen, that was great. Um, I think Diana also had Diana also had a mixed methods project. Do you wanna add a little bit more, Diana, too, about your project? Yes, thank you. I, I was when I was here in Eileen, it was re it resounded me as well, <laughs> because we we had that 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 two phase and and it was really we we went we, we had an additional factor it was COVID and our IRB did not work well <laughs> with with the 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 research in the in a uh, during COVID so we had some restrictions are there. And so what we end up doing is we went to, to Puerto Rico and we visited what, but I end up doing like interviews through, through Zoom because of that constraints that, that I had. So that we, we, we re, uh, reorganized our way of collecting the, the qualitative data. And, uh, and another thing is we had the quantitative data uh, and we started doing that at, be, at the beginning uh, so, so getting getting the definitely the results by the by the by April first was was a real challenge. We were running around with with a lot of um. So we we included the analytic the the quantitative analysis, and from the qualitative, we were still doing our analysis while we were a, a refining our, our our revised report. So that was the way we went up uh, working around that. Thank you, Diana. Um, and I see a question by uh, from Diego. Do you want to jump on Diego and ask your question about technical support? I think Diego might have the mic problems he said earlier. Oh, okay, yeah. earlier, yes. So Diego asks that for early career researchers, will there be any technical support from the Natural Hazard Center? And he means in terms of research methods, ethics, et cetera. Um, he said, I'm thinking of the possibility that we encounter ourselves with issues that we might not know how to resolve. Uh, Rachel, do you want to answer that one? Sure. Um, so if you look on the web page where we have uh, information about the special call, you will note that we do provide a number of resources in the form of uh, free online training modules uh, that talk about things like ethics, public health implications of research, um, IRB applications, et cetera, which are really great uh, resources. Um, in addition, we also offer a number of check sheets that can be used um, to help uh, you prepare as you enter and embark in the field to conduct research, um, as well as a number of other resources that are all listed on our webpage. In addition to that, um, uh, it is actually a requirement uh, both in the before submitting a proposal to schedule a 15 minute consultation with me where we would discuss your methods, uh, discuss your research questions, and I would provide you know, recommendations about how to create uh, a proposal um, that that could actually lead to a research project that is feasible uh, given all the constraints like the time and the ability to conduct certain analyses, et cetera. In addition, uh, if you are um, part of a group that is funded, uh, you will have the opportunity also to meet with either me or Megan uh, prior to submitting your report. Uh, and we will provide a study design and methods consultation, again, to ensure that you have uh, a good idea and grasp of the methods you're going to be using and that you can actually complete them in the time um, that you've set out to do. So those are the various ways that we do support um, researchers uh, in, in wanting to um, accomplish this. Um, in addition, if I don't know, you said early career researcher, if you are a student, uh, one of the things that we do require um, is that you have a letter of support uh, from your faculty advisor who could vouch for your ability to be able to uh, conduct the, the research that you are proposing. Thank you, Rachel. Um, next question comes from Lauren. She asks, oh, would a proposal that doesn't include field work be competitive? What if you want to answer that? Sure, I'll go ahead. Lauren, did you want to say what kind of, um, we do accept proposals that are looking at secondary data, so go ahead, submit that. But if you have more specific question about what you're thinking about, go ahead. Yeah, I was just, uh, so I'm doing some work looking at rural, um, 
uh, aging populations and rural areas and disaster risk. And so, um, you know, five months would be a really motivational time frame to develop some measures and attach it to existing cohort data that exists. Um, we don't have a great uh, approach in the U.S. for measuring um, direct health effects or indirect health effects due to lack of pre-event data. So I'm really working on merging disaster measures uh, with existing cohort data. Would something like that be? I think so. Rachel, do you want to go ahead and jump in? But that sounds very interesting to me and something that would be competitive, definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely. I, I, we do value, um, you know, our funders, funders at the CDC really value quantitative uh, projects and mixed methods projects. And so if you are able to source data that already exists, whether you were involved in, you know, collecting that cohort data or it's secondary data that was, you know, publicly available, that's really great. Um, we definitely encourage that. Um, and if you could, you know, couple that with maybe a smaller, you know, on the, in the fields, you know, uh, data collection, that would make a very strong proposal. Yeah, Lauren, I just want to say one more thing about that in terms of being competitive. It is actually very competitive because the feasibility of your ability to, to complete the research in a timely manner actually is really strong if you already have pre-existing data. So um, yeah, I would definitely say submit that idea. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, May, May Rose, would you like to jump on and ask your question? I love hearing from all of you instead of my own voice. <laughs> Hi, aloha. This is me, Rose, from Hawaii. Um, so I do, it's actually two, I do publish in scientific journals. So if, if it's okay to publish it, publish our findings in scientific journals. Aside from that, I do report back to the community, whether it's radio or going to the community itself and offer a function and report back the findings to the community, if that's fine. I'll go ahead and answer that. We would love both of those things. So yes, um, we would you know, once you publish either in a scientific journal or whatever, if you do some type of radio interview, you want us to promote that on the website, we would love to hear about it. And we really encourage everyone to be doing things like that. And we do uh, clearly outline in our award agreement. So if you are a project that's funded, uh, we just ask that you acknowledge us as, as your funders. Um, but of course, the more dissemination, the better. Um, I just have one more um, response to that question about publishing. And then, um, so in your award agreement, we do have um, acknowledgement information that you would need to require uh, or need to include on any future publication. And that we do just ask that you publish your quick response report first before you publish in an academic journal. Um, and then it's up to that journal whether or not they will accept um, a report that actually has been published online already first. So you might have to change it quite a bit to publish in a journal depending on their criteria. But we do allow you to publish the information that we've already put online. Um, it just has to happen first. Uh, Diana. Yeah, I wanted to highlight that because uh, I, I've been like, I, I've been pursuing for publication of the findings through like another research paper on, on a transportation journal. So it, it, one thing I want to highlight is what already Jennifer told about the having the acknowledgement that you already, there's a, a template that in, in your award, you would get that indication of what is the citation, how would you uh, frame your acknowledgement se uh, section for the uh, for the, the project itself. But yeah, it's, it's really encouraging. And I also think about going to the community and, and kind of uh, displaying, sending them the, the results and, and sharing that with them. It's very, very, I think it's a good, a good way of getting back to what the information that they gave us. Wonderful, thank you, Diana. Um, let's see. Oh, Thomas has a, another great question. Uh, Tomas, do you wanna come on in and ask your question? Yeah, I would love to hear an example of how uh, the reports that you publish on the National Hazard Center website, uh, if any of them have led to actual policy change, um, that would be wonderful to hear. Rachel or Megan, do you want to take that? Yeah, I'm, I offhand, I, I don't know if any specific policies from reports have been enacted unless I'm, I'm missing something. I know that these research projects gain a lot of traction. Um, we, you know, we we take the metrics and see all the people who end up reading them and, um, and you know, the various awardees will then go on and use their reports to go and, you know, disseminate those findings to various stakeholders, including potentially policymakers. Um, 
uh, I know that, for instance, there was a project that worked with the Social Vulnerability Index uh, in Guam, and that they the CDC had a lot of interest in that because that was originally a metric, you know, that they had created for um, the the mainland United States as well as Puerto Rico, and so there have definitely been great collaborations that have resulted uh, based on this research. Um, I don't know if you uh, anyone wants to add as to any specific report that. Um, you're thinking of that was like really great and, and change that it uh, drove. Lori, do you have any on the top of your head to speak to? I, I was just going to say I so appreciate the question and it's at the heart of all of the award programs and Thomas, we could, the quick response program, for example, that we've administered for over 35 years, we have nearly countless examples of where th those research projects have then been translated into practice as well as policy change, everything from one of our earliest reports at the Hazard Center, which resulted in, it was a report on what happened to people in the Big Thompson flood in 1976 in Colorado, which is still one of the deadliest disasters in our state's history. And now all across the state, there are climb to safety signs in all areas at risk to flash flood in canyon areas, for example. So it's everything from that sort of very concrete applications to broader policy change related to um, working with vulnerable populations and so forth. But with this program specifically, it's so new, it's only a couple of years old. And so I think Rachel's examples were great that right now this first two years of funding have really been laying the groundwork for collaborations, have been putting the infrastructure in place for that broader practice and policy change that we really seek to achieve. And that I think you definitely know from your own beautiful work um, that takes a lot of time, but also takes a sort of resource commitment. And so, um, the CDC, I think we can say this, that uh, that round one and round two award recipients, we have a continuation call right now that is open only to those award recipients for exactly the reason you're suggesting, Thomas, because we realize that oftentimes in a year, this kind of change doesn't get ha happen. The, the research happens, but then you need more support, more funding to keep the relationships and to really get the applications in place. And so that's what sort of the longer term vision that we're working on right now. So thank you again for asking that. Thank you, Lori. And I know we only have three minutes left, but I wanted to make sure Sophia gets to ask her question because her hand was raised. Sophia, would you like to jump on? Yes, thank you. Uh, I hope that you hear me well, yes. Uh, so I was just wondering that we we're talking about results dissemination. Um, could we include uh, that those activities related to results dissemination in the budget? Would it be okay? And if so, and, and would it be okay even if the results dissemination activities happen after the end of the project? Megan or Rachel, do you want to answer that? Uh, sure, unless Megan, you want to. Uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> We, we, you are allowed to, to have line items in the budget that relate to disseminating your results, you know, such as, you know, going and submitting an open access journals, going to conferences and presenting your uh, results, um, you know, having community meetings where you can invite members of the community to, to share um, that data. I, I don't know specifically, Jen, if there are timeline requirements on that, you may be the better person to answer. Yeah, so the timeline around that is definitely included in the budget. It's, it's we are, you know, are very eager to have proposals that it, we, it's one of the requirements is that you have a dissemination plan. So of course we will financially support that part of the project. Um, and while that doesn't necessarily need to be the output in your report on March 31st, all dissemination related activities do have to be completed by the end of the award, um, the entire project, which is August 4th, um, to 2023. And so those activities would have to be completed before August 4th. Okay, great. Let's see if there's other questions. Anybody else wanna jump on and ask a question with the one minute we have left? Any other burning thoughts? Oh, we do have a question um, from Deborah here. It says, we have an instrument to measure community, emotional and social resilience that we can uh, that we have been using in our work. This instrument can remain our property. Our team wants to make sure this as I ask the question. Um, I guess I'm not really understanding what, what do you mean by your property, like your intellectual property? Uh, so I, we've got a psychologist that developed this instrument. We've been using it 
for several years. And I think he just wants to make sure that that would remain. He's He has um, copywritten it, but he wants to make sure that it remains our property and it does not become your property. And that's that was a question I was asked to ask. Yes, thank you for the question, Deborah. We definitely, we would, if you can remain your property, your instruments that you use, of course, we would also encourage you to publish your instruments on DesignSafe, which we encourage all the social science researchers and others on here to do. And that actually gives you a DOI, so you can add that into your citations in your report. So if anybody else wanted to draw from that um, intellectual property, they would have to cite you. And so that's just one way to keep that as your um, product. And so I know we're at time now. So I just want to thank everybody so much for being here. Please reach out to us at any time if you have additional questions. Has.research.awards at colorado.edu is our email address. And we'll get back to you right away to answer your questions. And uh, we look forward to seeing proposals from all of you. Thank you so much, everyone.